At some fateful point in your computer science journey, you're probably going to hear the terms leak code, and here's some pretty opinionated advice as well on how you can do well at leak code and pass your interviews. In today's video, I want to debunk some common leak code advice that you might hear and why it's not actually the best way to move forward with your leak code practice. Hi, I'm Laura, a PM working in tech, and on my channel, I share my life as a PM, my life working in tech, and other computer science related advice. Lead coding is certainly a struggle for many people, myself included, so hopefully this will help steer you on the right path when it comes to figuring out what the right solution and strategy is for you. The first common piece of advice that I really hear is just grind lead code and you can pass any technical interview. Yes, lead coding is a huge part of technical interviews and a lot of companies now are asking lead code style or algorithmic style questions in order to test your coding ability. Also, yes, you do need to know how to code in order to pass a technical interview, and leak code is one way to be able to get better at coding and solving problems in a specific manner. Also, yes, being good at programming and knowing how to leak code and be able to do leak code well is probably a good sign that you're a strong and proficient programmer. However, despite how great you might be at leak coding at any given day, that's not going to be enough to just guarantee you the interview or guarantee you the offer at any stage in the game. Here are two key counter examples. One is even if you're amazing at lead code and you're amazing at solving these problems, that's not going to matter until you can actually land yourself an interview. So you can grind lead code for 24 hours a day, but if you're not getting any interviews, then there's zero payout for doing that. Instead, if you're in this camp of applying to tons of places but never hearing back, chances are you definitely need to spend more time on your resume than you do need to spend time on lead coding and grinding it out there or also spend your time getting your foot in the door and getting relevant experiences or networking or any host of other opportunities that basically get your name out there and make it a higher chance that your resume will actually get seen and placed further into the interview stages. The second counter example I have is say you do get the interview. You can make it into the interview, ace the technical problem, but when it comes to actually elaborating what you're doing and how you're thinking through it, there could be a huge lapse in communication there. When it comes to working in engineering teams and being able to work with other people, communicating how you got to somewhere and where you are is going to be a lot more important than just being able to bang out any technical solution in the long run. The second most common piece of advice that I hear is that you need to know how to do lead code if you want to get a job in tech. Yes, if you're aiming for a Fang or Manga or Unicorn Startups or any kind of similar adjacent company, you're probably going to need to know how to lead code and be able to do that well. However, there are still tons and tons of other companies out there that may not necessarily ask you to do the coding problem or have alternative methods of assessment instead to test your coding skills and proficiency. For example, for my very first internship after my first year of college, I didn't have to do any coding interview-esque questions. It was literally just a behavioral interview and a couple of questions about the experiences that I had listed on my resume. There's also a huge curated list of companies that don't ask that whiteboard or lead code style question and offer these take home assessments instead or other sorts of projects. Just anecdotally from when I was doing the full-time new grad job hunt, about three or four out of the 50 or 70 companies I applied for had a project-based assessment as the initial screening rather than the live coding sessions or otherwise online coding assessments. I think the key thing for this though is to keep in mind where your limits are. Some of these projects can get pretty involved and they also might be asking a lot of you just in a few days. If you realistically don't have the bandwidth, capacity, or motivation to do these, then consider dropping them and just lessening the load on your plate a little bit. Out of the four take-home assessments that I did receive, I thought about two of them would have taken more than a day for me to validate and implement that it was a fully working solution, so I opted not to do those and not to pursue the interview process with them anymore. Job hunting is almost a full-time job in and of itself, and there is a lot to balance as a student, especially when you're doing this with tons of other responsibilities and classes going on on the day-to-day -day as well. But turning back to the original point, beyond those kinds of top tier name brand companies, there are a lot of companies out there that don't actually really ask you to do leak coding questions or kinds of technical assessments in that nature. The third leak code advice I've heard is you need to do X number of questions to be really, really good at leak code. All I can really say to this is no. Doing 100 lead code easy questions is dramatically different from doing 100 lead code hard questions, and it's also different from doing 25 easy, 50 medium, and 25 hard. It's pretty impossible to compare the number of lead code questions that you've done with how successful you feel because some people are naturals right out the gate and they're pretty good at it, and some people really, really need to do tons and tons of questions to really get the hang of it. But what this really comes down to is just because the person sitting next to you has done 200 lead code questions and you've only done 50, doesn't mean that you're necessarily less well prepared for the interview. I think what it really comes down to is as long as you've done questions from a wide variety of topics, different difficulties, and you feel comfortable tackling the easies and the hards, then you're probably in a pretty good space. 
I think the most common list of questions you'll probably find is going to be the Blind 75 list of liquid questions. And I do agree that I think this is a pretty good set of questions and they tackle the spectrum of different topics that you might encounter in a programming interview. That being said though, maybe you'll need to only do 50 of those 75 questions or you might need to do 125 questions in a similar manner to the 75 presented. It all really just depends on how quick you learn and how easy these things are for you to pick up. There's really no right or wrong answer on the number of lead code questions you need to do, and whether you've done 10 lead code questions or 500 questions, there's no need to brag about it. Fourth, I heard tons of people touting that, hey, you need to practice for X hours a day, or do this amount of practice leading up to your interview. Also, not a very black and white piece of advice here. Generally speaking, I think there's a lot of evidence out there that distributed recall or distributed practice and doing frequent recall is going to be a lot better for you in the long run in terms of finding success than just trying to pound everything out in an eight hour cram session the night before your interview. A little context on distributed practice, hopefully you've seen the forgetting curve, but if you haven't, it just says that on day zero, you've learned something and over the next couple of days, that knowledge quickly and rapidly deteriorates from your memory. Over the next couple of days, as you do more subsequent practice, you're going to remember more in your initial sessions and you're also going to forget less as days go on. Basically, if you want to learn things and have it stick, then doing distributed practice is going to be the best result for you. Lead coding, like many other things, is just another habit for yourself to get into and make it easier on yourself by creating systems that you can fall back on. If you make it prohibitively hard to stick with your goal of lead coding every day, for example, then you're probably going to fall off the wagon pretty fast. I find that 15 to 30 minutes is a pretty good practice length for lead coding or learning anything a little bit more difficult because after that my attention span just tanks and my motivation to keep working on lead code, especially if I'm struggling, is pretty low at that point. 30 minutes is usually enough time to dive into one or two problems and really wrap your head around what's going on and how you can do better on the next session. Of course, 30 minutes a day probably isn't going to be the greatest for you if you have an interview coming up in a day, for example. So maybe it's appropriate to ramp up the time that you spend lead coding the night before or a couple weeks before you have your first interviews. In any case, make sure that you're actually incorporating breaks into your study routine so that your brain has a little bit of downtime to process and absorb the information that you've already learned. Lastly, the thing that I want to end on is the advice that lead code is just really easy to pick up. First response is, eh, yes and no. I think firstly, the concept of lead coding is pretty easy to pick up. At its core, lead coding is just using a data structure or algorithm to solve a technical problem with usually some sort of special technique in there that makes it easier to solve the given problem. A lot of beginners may struggle to lead code a little bit, but once you find and hit your stride with maybe solving an easy question or two, you start to get a little bit more into a groove of lead coding and understanding how it works. Cool. Yes, in that sense, lead coding is easy to pick up because it's the same kind of problem that you're going to be tested with. I think the second layer that kicks in here that makes it a little bit more difficult is actually just having the knowledge to know when to use what and how to use it. And that's just the kind of thing that comes with practice, which is going to be hard to do if you feel frustrated, unmotivated, or just hitting a dead wall with lead coding in the first place. With all these different layers, techniques, and ways to solve an approach or problem, that really only kicks in more at the medium to hard level, but it is present in a few of the lead code easy questions. You probably will have to see a similar problem or know about the topic in order to solve every problem in the most efficient manner. I think the best example of what I mean by this is dynamic programming. There are a few lead code easy questions that rely on dynamic programming in order to reach the most efficient solution. And if you just have never heard of dynamic programming before, it's not gonna be likely that you can just stumble upon the answer and land on the right thing. Maybe that's just me though, because I had an extraordinarily difficult time with dynamic programming problems. But I think the real advice that I wanna give coming out of this is that don't be frustrated if you're hitting a block when it comes to solving those medium and hard problems in particular. They really often do have some sort of special trick, but if you haven't seen this kind of problem before, it's going to be a lot easier once you have in the future moving forward. Also, if you're struggling just to keep up with lead code, then go back to the basics. How can you incorporate just 5 to 10 minutes of looking at a problem and thinking through the solution without even necessarily needing to code it? Then move up to larger behaviors like actually writing up a solution and checking and running through test cases. And before you know it, it'll be easier for you to get in the habit of lead coding and build it up into a daily part of your routine. I hope that walking through these made a little bit more sense. Advice is often given in the hopes that it does someone else good, but it's also not going to be a one-stop solution for everyone. Giving advice and receiving advice is honestly a pretty personal thing, so what works for one person isn't always going to work for the next person. Take most things that you see, read, or hear with a grain of salt and modify it to work for you. As always, thank you all so much for watching. If you want to join in on the conversation, click the link in the description box below to join my Discord channel or schedule a coffee chat with me using ak.ms slash chat with Laura. I'll see you again next week for a brand new video. Bye.